so, so what's the story? So we know now that you know the best companies in you know in there communicate emotion rather than logic. So now we know that's the case. You know what's the reason for it? And it's to build a tribe. It's to build a loyal following of people who all think the same kind of way, have the same belief systems, have the same moral code, have all the same kind of attributes that you build a little group of them. And how how do you do it? What are the there's four steps to doing it, which is know your target market, stand for something, have a have a thing. You post content that resonates with your target market, and then you create a tribe around the thing, not you. It all sounds very, very simple. And it actually, it's not that complicated. It just requires a consistency and a discipline to do. So how do we do that? So I'll walk you through another little case study. So know your target market. The, if I was to kind of say what's, you know, questions are what's the number one thing that people aren't doing, it's that. It's doing work on understanding who you serve. Because that's the other way of looking at it is who do you serve? Who is your client? Who's going to buy from you? You know, market, you market to someone. You try and all things to all people, we become nothing to no one. So we have to be quite niche and focused on who it is we're marketing to. I'll give you an example of this. So half my family live in the US. So I'm kind of slightly tuned into the US sports market. So I will explain if none of you are not, like, not US sports fans, but I'm sure you know who this guy is. <laughs> yeah. Might have seen him once or twice, yeah. <laughs> Dwayne The Rock Johnson. So in 2016, uh, upstart sports brand Under Armour signs a deal with Dwayne Johnson to create, let's say, a global partnership. So Project Rock was born, where Dwayne Johnson designed stuff, um, used his, you know, his his own brand to support Under Armour. And at the time, you know, Nike, Adidas, all a little bit flat, and it was all a bit boring. When you got The Rock on your side. All of a sudden, the game is on. So Nike went, took, a, took a step back. And they had a kind of a strategic kind of uh, analysis a few years beforehand. And looked, they wanted to go after three types of customers. Women, young athletes, and runners. So I don't know if you know, but you know, there's a really good book called Shoe Dog, actually, if you want to learn about how Nike was effectively created, but generally it was, it was the runner market was the first kind of avatar that they had. So women, young athletes and runners. That's who they went for. So they knew their target market and then stand for something. And they got a little, say lucky, but they also had to be pretty brave. So who knows, who, do you know who this guy is? Yeah, I know this, know this whole story very well. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. So this is um, Colin Kaepernick. He um, was the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. So NFL is the second largest sport in the US after baseball. The San Francisco 49ers are a marquee team, one of the top teams in, uh, in the NFL. And he was a quarterback, so he's like the, the key position. And not only just a quarterback, I think this season before he'd been in the Super Bowl. So he's a Super Bowl quarterback. This is a guy at the top of his, top of his game. And he took a stand by kneeling, as it says. You know, he, he took... Um, a stand against the treatment of African Americans by the US police force, um, or by various police forces. And regardless of the politics, he did this in pre season 2016. And this basically got him fired, got him fired from the 49ers, but also um, allegedly blackballed by the NFL. So the owners colluded to basically prevent him from getting a job anywhere else. Um, so since yeah, 2016, he's never played, never played a game again. And Nike took him and put him as the face of their 30th anniversary campaign for Just Do It. So believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. And that billboard is on top of the Nike store in San Francisco. So in the heart of 49ers country, they put the billboard the size of a house on top of it. Provo provocative? Pretty much. And what do you think the reaction was? Well, Conservative America went a bit batshit, if I'm honest. So they started to cut the, the swoosh out of their trainers. Um, massive kind of pushback on Nike gear, setting fire to it. Now, what did you notice about this guy? He's wearing them so he's not very bright. <laughs> he's wearing them, yeah. Yeah, 
it's funny when you do that. Some people notice the fact he's oh he's not like he's not a woman an athlete or a young a uh, young athlete or a runner. No, definitely not. But he's also burning the shoes on his feet. Um, so he's definitely not Mark, Nike's target market. But there are other instances as well. Rochester man accidentally burns down home after lighting Nike shoes on fire in protest of Nike's Colin Kaepernick ad. This is all great marketing for them, though. Absolutely. This is all content. So they kind of got lucky in a sense. It's like suddenly the reaction started to market their own decision for them. So then all they had to do was then post content that resonated with their, you know, the, they could obviously see who they were pissing off. So all they had to do was post content to target the guys who were responding to it. Um, so they did a spoof campaign. Uh, Nike out with shoes designed to look like they've been burnt. They really stoked it up. And the result of that was they got a slightly unexpected chain, unexpected benefit is Nike became more relevant. They became cool. Or again, they went from, you know, in my mind, my, my sort of mind, you know, when we were kids growing up, you had like, Nike Air Max. But then, like, when your dad starts wearing Nike Air Max, you don't want to wear Nike Air Max anymore. But, you know, they changed. They added another kind of dy dynamic to their, um, to their business, dramatically increasing prices, winning over new customers. And if you look at it from a share price point of view, so that's when the ad went out. Bit of a spike and then a slight a decline, but it bounced. And the difference is, in fact, what I look at this is Nike have turned over their client base. So the people who are buying at this point aren't the guys who are buying here. They just had to go through shedding all that customers, shedding those non the, the people who are not their target market to grow again. And if you this is a similar process in any size business. And I've been working with clinics and it's like, right, well, we need to, you want to turn your business over, you're going to take a hit because you've got to get rid of them before you become relevant and start to resonate with your new clients. And it can take about, take three months. In some instances, I mean, this, this is a year and a half, I think, that, that, but it's amplified. So just do it. And then you create, so you create the tribe then around the thing, not you. And Here's some examples, other examples. So Apple, you know, what's, what's their thing? An effective product suite. So when it, and you know how effective the product suite is when they've got you locked in, is when I have the Apple Watch, I have a phone, I have two iPads and a Mac. And when someone calls you on FaceTime and they all go off, it's pretty, it's kind of like, which one do I answer it on? When did my Mac become a phone? So they've got this effective product suite. And who is the emotive, personal brand behind Apple, Steve Jobs. Still, uh, all these years after his death, uh, you still think of Apple and Steve Jobs in, in the same, um, same space. And this is important because a lot of practitioners, a lot of businesses hide behind the brand. And when you join Aesthetic Entrepreneurs, we vet you. So you ask to join, and then we'll go into your Facebook page, and generally there's a Facebook picture of a dog uh, and then there's no link to your business. So then we Google you and we find the website and then we go through the whole thing. And then page five in a tiny little corner is a picture of the actual practitioner. But it's your business. You have to be the one standing loud, proud and talking about it. Because if you're not going to champion your business, then who is? You can't afford to hide anymore. You can't afford to be the person three or four layers back. You can have the brand but you still have to be thinking from a human point of view. You very rarely see the Aesthetic Entrepreneur's brand and my face separate. We are together. Yes, it's a brand, but it's been driven by me. Another example, Virgin. So what's their thing? Well, you say this in a room full of nurses and they'll tell you that it's a systematic destruction of the NHS. But their thing, again, effective product suite. Loads of stuff. Virgin, how, you know how Virgin work? Is essentially they are an investment company now. They will invest in 50% of a company, put their brand on it. If it works, happy days. If it doesn't, they'll can it. If we remember Virgin Cosmetics, they basically bought a cosmetics company, stuck the Virgin logo on it, brand for it. Virgin V, didn't work. But if you look at this, you know, got um, Virgin Digital, Virgin Nigeria Cargo, didn't know that existed. You know, Virgin Galactic, Virgin Blue, Virgin Wines, Limo, they're all different companies, very different sectors from um, all the Virgin brand. 
Why? Because who's the emotive personal brand behind Virgin? Richard Branson, the entrepreneur's champion. Virgin has become an entrepreneurial incubator, in a sense. And if it wasn't for his brand as an entrepreneur, would it have worked? Probably not. So you can see that you know, the person drives the brand and vice versa. Virgin and Richard Branson are connected at, at such a level that he, what he does affects the brand.